Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Loud enough? Okay. So first I want to thank Chris and I want to thank uh, Bob, uh, who I understand is a bit delayed. He'll be here in about 10 minutes. Uh, he and I were chatting one day and he invited me to come and present in Post Lakes uh, some of the work I've been doing on co-creation. I also want to thank uh, Jane Dutton. Uh, she's also been encouraging me uh, as uh, I've been kind of expanding my vistas on co-creation. And what I'm going to do essentially is to kind of split the talk into two parts. The first part, try to give you a sense of value creation as a co-creation. That's very important to kind of understand how the world is changing and where we need to get to. And then I'm going to switch to how enterprises need to transform themselves to, to get to co-creation. And in a nutshell, it turns out that the way you get to co-creation is actually through co-creation inside the organization. So that's basically the punchline. Uh, and the rest is just pizza and fun. <laughs> okay. So uh, what I'm going to do uh, is kind of preface all of this by giving you just some sense of kind of why co-creation, uh, why do we need to pay attention to it. If you go back over the last 100 years, we're all familiar here, at least in this audience, with the art of the value chain, uh, as popularized by Michael Porter at Harvard. And uh, it's really been a framework through which enterprises think about creating value. In fact, the value chain comes from the term that the activities of the enterprise create value. And then you create and deliver products and services to uh, customers and other folks. My starting point, actually, is uh, December 2012. And if you look around you, the world has changed. <laughs> Fundamentally, what has happened is that we have this kind of right-to-left movement out there in the world, uh, shown by the color yellow. And individuals today are essentially so much informed and connected. I'm sure you all have one of these in your pockets. Uh, that wasn't the case about five years ago. I just read in The Economist there are 4.8 billion of these. Uh, there are 1.6 billion people online. So there's something dramatic that has happened in terms of access to information and how we can actually connect with each other. My daughter texts me every 10 minutes. Uh, so, in a way, it's good. I'm in the know, and things are not as foggy as before in my head, although we have real fog outside. So, it brings some sense of transparency to me in terms of what she's, where she is and what she wants to do. And, you know, I've just changed, you know, pick me up 10 minutes later today. That's good, so I don't wait there. So, there's lots of things that happen by the sheer fact that today we can all be connected. We can share information. We can share our experiences of uh, events and so on and so forth. So, to me, uh, what is going on is that on the left-hand side, you look at this. And for a long time, as I've been kind of working through this, the waters of co-creation, uh, I usually get a lot of resistance from the blue side because people go, they think that this is trouble. If you go back to the music industry, you know, they thought the yellow side were pirates. We were pirating music until Apple iTunes uh, came about and has been the biggest success story of just totally transforming the way we experience music. So to me, it's not that the glass is getting half empty. It's getting half full, and it's just really, if you look at it, it's a whole new world of opportunity despite all of the structural problems we have in the economy today, a lot of which is because I think we're looking at the world through the blue lens. So I actually believe that if you look over the next 100 years, we are actually going to uh, embark on this huge new way by which we can actually create value, which is the focus of the presentation. And as I go along, I'm going to link it to how we can create wealth in society and how we can actually create enhanced welfare and well-being for all. In fact, co-creation actually, by definition, is founded on the principle of expanding our experiences as human beings. So that's the kind of link back to the, the, the positive organizational scholarship work uh, that has been going on in the center. So the, the starting point is individuals and our human experiences. And if we actually start with that, which is in the center, uh, that's how we can actually expand creation of value rather than just kind of just a unilateral blue-sided view of the world. So I'm actually going to start from green, which, as you know, comes by mixing yellow and blue, right? <clears throat> And that's my starting point. And the word mixing is very important. It's not taking a blue Lego piece and a yellow Lego piece, bringing them together, because there's no transformation on either side. Blue is blue, yellow is yellow. What, what I'm ta actually talking about is paint mixing, which basically means that when you mix paint, and when my four-year-old did it, I just remember, he, was, he thought it was magic. And then he kind of wondered where the blue went. I said, no, it's there. He wondered where the yellow went. It's there. It's in green. So we're talking about this huge transformation of value creation. But in order to start with green, we need to change our lenses, clearly the positive lens, but we need to change the framework through which we can think about value creation. It's not just the blue. Blue doesn't go away. So that's an important point. But we need to expand our thinking in terms of value creation. So what I'm going to actually do is to click on the green part and just give you some sense of kind of the history of co-creation. Why is the shift occurring? 
Uh, and then what I'm going to do is to kind of give you some sense of what are the key elements of co-creation. We don't have time to go into that very deeply. So I'll use some examples just to kind of motivate you. And then we will go back to the blue side and say, how do you take a blue organization and make it green? That's my goal. Uh, we have designed our organizations for a blue world. So how do you create uh, the transformation on the blue side to actually take advantage of uh, opportunities for co-creation, which is actually, as we will see, in the self-interest of all. Uh, so co-creation actually is not win-win. It's what I call win more, win more, because it actually expands the pie. <clears throat> but we're getting ahead of ourselves, so let's kind of step back and kind of move slowly through the various pieces. So very quickly, co-creation is about joint creation and evolution of outcomes of value. And the word outcome is very important because what it suggests is that value is actually created through the process. So it's not like you come to the table with already saying, you know, I've created value. Here's my product that has value. Uh, of course, it has some value, but the whole process of creating value together actually generates more and better value for, for all, with all. So the with all is important, the last line, together with individuals. So there are various uh, kind of layers of co-creation here, and I'll try to kind of uh, uh, peel the onion. Not that I want to make you cry, but hopefully it's tears of joy. <laughs> so let's uh, uh, step back to see kind of what's going on on this yellow side. Again, uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I talked to you about the information and communication technology revolution, uh, <clears throat> interconnectedness of people around the world, uh, globalization, but also localization. Uh, we're looking at uh, people who basically argue for growth, but then they say they don't like all the consequences, like inequality, income inequality, which is a big issue today. So we're seeing this kind of uh, polarization of the world, if you will. And everywhere I go, I see people talk to me about that. On the one hand, they like uh, the fact that we can, we can grow through this. On the other hand, they're worried uh, that it will create a lot of inequalities uh, <clears throat> because the people who have access to a lot of this information and communication today uh, uh, generally tend to be uh, you know, a smaller part of the population, although, like I said, it's growing uh, more and more. So there are a lot of discontents in terms of uh, inequalities and freedoms and rights and so on. So there's a lot of drivers for where at least the yellow side wants to co-create value. Let's put it that way. The yellow side, I think essentially says, this is how we want to engage with you, the institution. The question really is for institutions in terms of how do they engage individuals to create uh, more value together. So to me, uh, the, my starting point is not the activities, like Porter was saying, activity chain, but I'm going to use the word interactions. To me, interaction is the new currency. It's, that's the, the locus of value creation in the future. Interactions among the individuals, interactions of individuals with institutions, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to now start with a core idea here of the idea of an enterprise as a nexus of interactions. You're all familiar with Ronald Coase and his argument of the enterprise or the firm as a nexus of contracts. That doesn't go away. But I think today we have to go beyond thinking of uh, a transactional view of the world in terms of contracts to really a nexus of interactions. So I'm going to kind of show you how, by thinking this way, we can actually unleash new sources of value. First, if you start thinking of interactions, it can be anywhere in the system. Clearly, interactions happen inside the organization. It happens outside. It happens everywhere today. And it's only growing more and more. Uh, that's actually good news, if you look at it that way. Interactions can be communal. It can also be personal. So, which suggests that we can create a lot of value through communities, as well as uh, at a very personal level, personalized value. And we'll see some examples. Interactions can be more collaborative. Uh, you see more and more of uh, people taking advantage of a lot of these new collaborative technologies to actually uh, work more effectively together. But at the same time, it also can be creative. So bringing creativity into the picture. And I'm sure you've seen examples of organizations tapping into creativity of people around the world. And interactions can be, be the uh, basis of new forms and new sources of value. Uh, this one requires some examples just to kind of appreciate how we, we, uh, what I mean by new forms and new sources. In other words, very quickly, value is not just the product or service, it's actually the human experience. And, and the human experience is, is a little hard to grasp, uh, not as tangible uh, as even a product or even a service has a lot of tangible elements. So the enterprise, essentially, the way I think about it is, if you think of a nexus of interactions and interactions as the locus of value creation, the enterprise is basically today becoming more and more a platform that actually connects the uh, Resources on the one hand, and any organization can tap into talent anywhere in the world today. There are lots of examples of uh, companies doing so, expanding the boundaries of its resources. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of opportunities out there. So how do you actually connect the two? And that's what I'm going to focus on uh, today. Now, as Chris mentioned, uh, 
I've been kind of obsessed with this idea for a while. And uh, uh, thanks to late uh, C.K. Vallad, who uh, you know, <clears throat> kept insisting that I don't let go, despite all the hurdles uh, uh, I've been facing, uh, because when you take something new, and I was talking with Bob the other day, is that you know, anything that has inherent in it this kind of uh, uh, elements of a paradigm shift, because you know, we all thought that, oh, gee, you know, the sun rolls on the earth. Remember that? Well, we see the sun, well, when there's sun, right, <laughs> rising up and setting. So, of course, but from where you stand, you think the sun is moving, and you're, you're still. And today, of course, we realize better. Something similar is happening here. We basically believe that the blue side ruled the world, right? Institutions were the center of gravity. And all we do is we are beholden to institutions. The yellow is beholden to blue. But I think that's changing now. And now we realize that perhaps it should be the other way around, or perhaps it's basically both sides engaging with each other uh, in this process of co-creation. So uh, going back to 1997 to 2004, uh, we essentially started thinking about co-creation. And the early work focused mainly on the blue side as being the company and the yellow side as being the customer. And as Chris mentioned, my, I'm kind of housed in marketing, so that's a natural place to start. And so we talked about the changing relationship between customers who are getting more informed uh, individually and as communities of users, for example, and how they're engaging with the blue side uh, more and more, and how some companies, uh, consumer companies, were actually taking advantage of that. So that was kind of one theme here in this book we then wrote, The Future of Competition. The second theme was that some of these companies were going beyond goods and services to really tapping into human experiences as a source of value. So we think about Lego, for example, one of the examples in this book, uh, as early as uh, 2002, they realized that their fan base was a huge resource, but they were really not tapping to it. Communities were creating, up, creating websites and enhancing the value of the Lego kit, and Lego was just building bricks. Now today all of that has changed, totally changed, and they've actually kind of embraced uh, the yellow side, so much so that the yellow is also in the blue's kitchen, meaning in their innovation process. And the blue has also gone to the yellow side. So it's kind of both. You can start with the yellow paint and add blue, you get green. You can start with blue and add yellow, you get green. So it's essentially opening up activities uh, on the blue side, inviting the customer to be an active collaborator all the way th from product development through delivery. And how much of uh, collaboration you want is all up to you. Uh, but the opportunity is there, especially in those, those kinds of companies where actually uh, the communities uh, are, have so much passion for the brand, it's not even funny. Sometimes uh, I was with the CEO of Lego, Jorgen Nordstrop, who kind of invited me last year for their uh, uh, in, uh, inside meeting where they're planning the strategy for 2011 to 2020. And his first remark was, we've really become very humble by the fact that, you know, here are our fans who actually sometimes, he said, when I walk the halls, I find they're more passionate about a brand than some of us here. <laughs> So that's really the power of actually bringing the yellow and mixing it into the blue, just as an example. So the idea of innovating around experiences that you see up there, uh, that's an important one. So if you look at kind of the early work, the, the, the core idea was the enterprise's next of interactions, but really taking advantage of this experience-based view of value creation, as we call it, and looking at innovation broader beyond products and services uh, to this new opportunity space of experiences. In the process, what Professor Prahlad and I also realized is that it actually expands your resource base. I mean, is the community of consumers, in the case of Lego, you know, are they just your customers, or should they also be part and parcel of you know, your active resource base, because they're actually helping you design new things? Uh, so it's a little interesting to think of uh, kind of what is their role. So if you have to let go of fixed roles, on the blue side, you're a producer, you think of the yellow side as a consumer, right? <coughs> Blue side produces, yellow side consumes. But now, the Lego is seemingly a co-producer, and, and Lego is also a co-consumer in the sense that people at Lego also play with Lego, and they can relate to the consumer experiences. So it's this kind of letting go of these fixed roles, which I, I'll come back to, is I think one of the challenges in co-creation. Then I had this whole, uh, uh, you know, Professor Paulas wrote his kind of masterpiece, The Fortune of the Bottom of the Pyramid, and uh, some of you have seen some also examples uh, uh, that uh, are there in Stuhart and Ted London's book where they actually talk about co-creation at the bottom of the pyramid. So you can see that you know, co-creation is not you know, just in, for the developed world, it's also for the developing world. Uh, we, have, we have some examples there, and as Professor Parallel was working on bottom of the pyramid, you know, I continued to kind of push the envelope as much as I could on co-creation. And uh, you know, thanks to uh, this work, uh, 
I, I got a lot of invitations into organizations who were actually practicing. They were kind of on the cutting edge of co-creation, seeing this and saying, hey, uh, you know, can we kind of work together to kind of figure out, like Lego, for example, how to actually take advantage and take it to the next level? So for me, it was a research opportunity, actually. I said, I, I don't have the answers, but happy to be part of this process and kind of co-create knowledge <laughs> right, together. And perhaps you'll benefit some, and I certainly am going to benefit. So I had a lot of these invitations, and I went around the world, different sectors. I got a lot, a lot of these kind of calls. People say, hey, you know, this is interesting. And everywhere I went, a couple of things happened. One is I present co-creation with customers, and somebody will politely pull me to the side of the end and say, have you ever thought about co-creation with employees? I go like, well, yes and no. I mean, not quite. You know, I, I don't work. I mean, I'm in marketing, right? I'm not in the management organizations kind of area. But they said, yeah, but you know, we'll, we'll teach you that. But can you help us with co-creation with employees? And suddenly I found my, myself participating in HR programs and uh, looking at organizational transformation. And I remember having chats with Bob Quinn, trying to then absorb, uh, you know, what is this whole field of organization about? Because my PhD was in marketing. And so that, so that was kind of one turn there, looking at this kind of whole thing internally. At the same time, somebody would pull me aside and say, gee, have you looked at multi-stakeholder engagement? You know, we are an NGO. You know, we really work with different entities or an enterprise working with NGOs. Um, have you thought about, like, working with different types of stakeholders, you know, suppliers? And so that happened. Then in the last, uh, you know, kind of, uh, this book came out in 2010, like 2008, 2009, you know, thanks to what happened in 2007, the Great Recession. I also happened to engage with the public sector. I, used to, I found myself in the Prime Minister's office in Dubai one day, for example. And he's saying, have you thought about engaging citizens? I mean, we are the public sector, we are the government. We'd love to co-create with citizens. Uh, why? Well, the Singapore government, if you go to the website, has this new mantra saying, the government is yeah, of the people, by the people, for the people, as Abraham Lincoln put it. But on top of that, their mantra is, we, co we want to co-create with the citizens. <clears throat> Not just for the citizens, for and with the citizens. So if you go to the website, that's kind of the tagline. So that's going around, and other people are looking to it and saying, gee, maybe we should start engaging our citizens more in terms of how we deliver our services and be a more responsive government. So I was kind of, kind of overwhelmed with all of this. Uh, so the best I could do, first of all, is write a book with all these examples in it. <laughs> and so I, I, I structured the book around different industries, sectors, examples. You'll see it. It's all over the world in different sectors. It has over 40 examples from 20 industries. Uh, so as a good researcher, you do that. And then I said, gee, it's time to step back and see, what does this mean? You know, if you really were to think of a theory of co-creation, what would that be? And that kind of led me to my next project, which is what I'm actually going to share with you today, which is my next book, which is coming out next year. And in that book, what I learned, so when I stepped back and I said, what is common across all these 40 examples? The one thing that kept popping out was all these organizations were saying, in order to actually tap into co-creation, we need to have a platform for engaging people. We need to think in terms of how we actually harness the power of interactions, electronically and also in live meetings. Second thing that popped out was, we need to design this purposefully, think in terms of how value gets harnessed, number one. Second, we need to actually ask people what their experience was and come back and redesign things. We have to make it a conscious act and we need to have processes inside the organization to take people's actual experiences and how they experience the organization, its processes and its products and services, and plow that back and make the platform a better platform. So in a moment, I'm going to give you some examples of platforms. Now, this room can be a platform. It's got, you know, tables and chairs. It's got, it's got people, most important. Okay? But the way we design engagements in terms of interfaces and processes is kind of very interesting. For example, just to give you a quick example, I just gave a talk recently, kind of scary. As I was giving the talk, there were about like 600 people in the audience, and they had uh, two screens on either side. They had a live Twitter channel, and people were tweeting on, on my talk, live. And I'm going like, holy cow. And at the end, the person comes for a Q&A session and says, Venkat, we got lots of questions. I hope you're going to come to our blog site and answer some of these questions. We don't have time for all of them. So I've picked like five or seven, and so let's go. And they were all there. And the entire feed was captured. Even now I can go and double click on it, and I'm actually still learning and saying, hmm, that's an interesting question. So suddenly I realized, here I am on the blue side as a professor. On the yellow side, you have you know, students, right, executives. But again, letting go of fixed roles, I'm also a co-student, just like they're also co-professors. So this idea of co is very important. That is, you know, it's not just about teaching, it's about my learning. And they're actually also teaching me. And it's not them just learning. 
there's also a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, effect uh, in the community. So that's just a simple example of, yes, there was a live meeting. And if you actually go there, it's ongoing. The people who attended that event are still sharing content, their experiences. They're talking about it. And if I you know, don't respond to something, I'll get a nice polite email saying, Venkat, do you mind responding to this question? It's got a lot of people interested. <clears throat> so I don't know, good news or ba bad news? Is the bottle half empty or half full? Well, you can make up your mind. But if you look at it as, gee, this is kind of a very different way. It really expands value. It creates knowledge for me faster. Maybe it's good news for me. But then do I have the capabilities to actually engage in it? And can I actually harness the power? I think that's where the issue is, is how do you build the, the capabilities to actually do that? So enterprises and nexus of interactions sounds nice. It's at the nexus of persons and artifacts, smart artifacts today. Everything is getting smarter. I was in a session where the table was smart. You know, people actually had embedded stuff in there. So more and more, we are uh, embedding artifacts with intelligence. Uh, and then, of course, we have management and business processes on the, on the left-hand side. So the enterprise is sitting at this kind of nexus in terms of creating offerings with people uh, and then stakeholder relations, generating ideas and decision-making. And uh, I then kind of reflected a little bit on some of my more recent work with the World Bank Institute last year on co-creating development. And then I said, gee, so it looks like you need to build platforms, but is that, is that all? And then you look at some of the other examples like Apple, and to cut a long story short, I actually realized that they were actually building ecosystems now. So any, anytime you go into Silicon Valley, the first word they use is how do you build an ecosystem like Apple? Because Apple doesn't own the ecosystem. The whole point is it has an ecosystem. It just leverages the resources from all the people who develop within the system. And its task is to actually create the platforms for those people to actually create the apps and the applications which Apple takes advantage of. And to me, there's a metaphor there. I think all organizations have to learn from that. That's how do you build platforms where the entire world can be a resource and selectively, of course, engage people based on what your strategy is and where you want to make a difference and essentially expand your competencies by tapping into the competencies in the ecosystem. So one day I kind of drew this chart, so to speak, in my head. And then I said, well, maybe that's it. Maybe if we want to think of a co-creation, we have to think in three levels. One level is, it's all about experiences of people, so that's one piece. The second piece in the middle is, we have to think about interactions, and we have to think about the enterprises and nexus of interactions and build platforms. And the third piece is, somehow we have to understand how to build the capabilities uh, to actually harness all the uh, collective intelligence out there and think in terms of building an ecosystem. And more and more, I dealt with the uh, kind of private-public partnerships uh, and working with social enterprises, the ecosystem view became very important because it was not only one kind of blue for those jazz fans who like Miles Davis, one of my favorite albums, come to think of it, kind of blue, but uh, it's actually many different kinds of shades of blue to working together. So it's not like one blue working with many yellows. It's many types of blues, some for-profit, some not-for-profit, some social enterprises, uh, some uh, private enterprises realizing they need help of um, uh, NGOs and so on and so forth. So when I look at the private-public social partnerships, I'm saying, gee, you know, that's kind of interesting. So there's actually many kinds of blue. I guess jazzing away with many kinds of yellow, there's a metaphor for co-creation, right? But how do you actually make it happen? How do you actually foster it? And how do you bring it back into the blue so you can manage it? And how do you plug it into your management systems so that you can actually uh, manage your strategy and performance and all of that stuff, without which probably the whole thing will collapse and become a mess. So. That is the basis of actually my new book, which is called The Co-Creation Paradigm. And it comes with a wiki, where, which kind of goes into a lot of the theory of all of these different pieces. So what I'm now going to do is actually shift to some examples. So we can kind of connect with a lot of these kind of words. So the framework is this kind of three-level framework in terms of experiences, engagements, and these ecosystem capabilities. And saying that you need to think of creating value in the actual level. The value of the stock is in your actual experience, so to speak. It is enabled by this room here through which we are creating value. And if you want to continue the discussion, maybe we need to have a website or something where we can continue this for those of you that are interested, uh, just like the uh, event organizer did with that uh, little Twitter feed. And we need to essentially try to figure out how to harness the capabilities and actually resources in the system on the blue side 
and the yellow side. The blue has a lot of external resources, and each of the stakeholders comes with their own social network of resources. So everybody's LinkedIn and is on Facebook, so to speak. So there's a whole social media of the connectivity across the yellow. The question is how do you actually harness it? So kind of think of starting from the blue and yellow and then enabling that mixing I talked about to actually release and generate new and more uh, valuable outcomes for all those involved. And if you can do that, then I think you're, you're bringing that positive lens to value creation. OK, let me uh, now switch totally to examples. So uh, for those that don't like academic talks, that's it. So I'm going to now kind of walk you through some quick examples so we can get a feel. So this is a company called Local, Local Motors, a startup, uh, two years old. Even if you were the richest, smartest, most talented person in the world, it would still be really hard for you to make a new original car. Now you can join the Local Motors co-creating team to help create, develop, build, and buy brand new cars. Here's how it works. First, join the community and everyone who's invited. Next, create new cars or help develop ongoing concepts. If you're a hot designer, create new cars by participating in a competition or submit a design to check out for review. If you love cars, vote to decide what will be developed. All designs are protected with a Creative Commons license to promote collaboration but protect your design ownership. Concepts with the most folks are developed in co-creation. Co-creation is working with your peers and the local owners team to help choose things like the body and interior details and components like engines and shots. You help develop the car and ensure it turns out the way you want. Once the car is fully developed, you can buy it and build it. Local owners open a micro factory in your region to build the cars you want to build. For example, local workers opened a micro factory in Phoenix to build the rally car. There are many more micro factories to come and more cars to build. So far, the LMA Street is the most popular in the Carolinas, the Green Apple is favored in Manhattan, and the Boston Bullet in Boston. Micro factories mean local jobs and the most convenient service. The micro factory model is also sustainable. Since cars are built one at a time, there is less waste. Plus, local motor businesses allow the use of locally available fuel sources and more rapid adjustment to changing technology. Not only can you be proud of building your own car, you can be proud of buying local. Your car is special because you make it. You can even design or choose a custom car scan for the body. Every car is numbered. Only 2,000 of each design will ever be made. It only takes two three-day meetings to build your car in a local motor's micro factory. Local motors provide all the help you need, but you are the lead builder. You can even bring someone to enjoy the experience with you. At the end of the second weekend, you drive your car home. With a new understanding of how your car works, you are a better, safer driver. So when you complete the building of your own car, you join the ranks of the most responsible car owners in America. Once the car is home, you can mod it. All chassis and body data is available. Modders, fabbers, and manufacturers. Click the download button to retrieve all the data you need to build anything with the route right. You can even sell what you build through the Local Motors website. Local Motors is not only co-created, it's open source. It's that easy. You can make a new original car. Just join the Local Motors community to help create Develop, build, and mod your car the way you want. So what I find fascinating is there are all these new startups, and less than five years old, with totally new business models, and actually I would say organizational forms like we discussed in the new book. And, and if, you, if you think about it, you know, a company like Local Motors, a car company, well, it's not going to displace you know, Ford or BMW uh, in the near future, but they have a very different model. They make cars. This is what... Uh, it's mind-boggling for me. I met the CEO, Jay Rogers, and I asked him, you know, how many employees do you have? Take a guess. Thousands and thousands of employees? Well, he's got less than 50 full-time people. A car company with less than 50 people? Well, wait a minute. That's not feasible. Well, if you ask a different question, what is your resource base? 
Well, millions of people. Well, how does it work? Well, first, I have a platform on the design side. Anybody can submit designs. They have a design contest, and they just uh, have rolled out the new car uh, last year uh, called Rally Fighter. And if you go to the website, you, they're fully transparent. They tell you how much they've sold, etc. I think they already have orders for over 1,000 of them. So they're reach, uh, reaching the 2,000 limit. Uh, and uh, it's actually, uh, you'll notice the uh, nameplate. It says Local Motors, and it says Sang Ho. That's the autograph of Sang Ho Kim, who is a Korean designer who actually designed that car, and he got $25,000 for it. That's the prize money. <clears throat> and uh, it's very interesting. If you go and look at now, the, there's a website for, of course, this car, and you, you click, I clicked on the manual. The manual is co-created. So people are actually writing and saying, hey, you know, we'll make a better manual here. Why? Well, first of all, you have the design platform. You also have a platform, remember you said, where the manufacturers uh, can actually build uh, parts for it and so on. So actually, it's open to everybody. The whole supply chain is involved in actually this part so that you, know, you have actually a manual that you can actually might be might want to read, unlike most manuals, right, which uh, goes into the glove box. So, so if you want to kind of find something, so they're actually using these tools to actually say, you know, let the users write some of the, the, the manual and the specifications. After all, you're going to maintain the car as well. It actually turns out that uh, while they're doing this, since they had already built the platform, and I see this more and more, they said, gee, why can't we leverage this platform in a different way? Why don't we open up this platform uh, to, uh, you know, Peter build trucks? So today, essentially, instead of them just building cars, they're actually offering the platform as a service to other manufacturers to say, hey, you may not have that platform, right? Don't invest in it. Come and use our platform. You've actually uh, built all these capabilities, but we can create a separate room in there for you, okay? And talk, let's talk about trucks. So Local Motors is a company that makes cars. It's also a company that is providing these services of platforms to anybody in the world. And this is a very important point. What it means is that, remember I said, uh, to really leverage it, you have to build a lot of these capabilities, uh, will involve a lot of IT and so on. Well, there are actually companies that will actually do that for you as well. So your task, all that remains today, I would say going beyond 2012, is, well, the platform part, there are people who will come and help you build it, right? You can do whatever you want with it. So it really then boils down to management. It's very innovating the management process for co-creation with all the individuals that are involved. To me, that's the, the crux of the matter. And that's where there's a huge challenge because we're not used to this. Uh, we're just used to the blue world. And so now we have to actually, if, if you use these platforms, we have to manage them, and we have to actually figure out how to actually make it work and connect it to the way we do business. <clears throat> but if we can do that, uh, as you'll see, at the end of the day, you're actually going to have happy people, right? Because they participated, they were involved, whether that person was a designer, whether that person was a manufacturer, whether that person was a customer, was a person who was, you know, the customer's aunt, doesn't matter. Every individual in this process essentially has a valuable experience. So if you actually look at the platform they actually have for building the car, it's kind of interesting. You actually go, you can actually bring one person with you. You can share it with your aunt, right? Because they have a web camera, you can put it on Facebook. You can actually show people you're building your own car. And they find that people are emotionally attached to it. And uh, it's, it's something else rather than something that came off a factory and that you didn't have any kind of involvement with. So there's something here about the fact that when you're connected to something, then there's more ownership of it. And I'll come back to this theme, particularly when we get inside the blue uh, in about 10 minutes. What is interesting now is they have opened it up. So now Domino's Pizza is redesigning its delivery vehicle using local motors platform to co-create a better Domino's pizza vehicle, and guess who's involved in this? Domino's Pizza employees. They drive the trucks. So all of a sudden, all these fixed things we had about, you know, you're a customer, you're an employee, and then we had all this stuff just for employees or for customers. We just have to start looking at the world as just individuals. They play different roles at the moment. You know, I'm a user when I use the product, but I can contribute to the design. In that sense, I'm kind of a part-time employee. So this kind of morphing of these different roles is kind of interesting. And in fact, uh, you'll see here, BMW is also involved, see? So are they actually competing with BMW? No. They make some cars. It's a niche product. The Rally Fighter costs 50,000 bucks. It's just, you know, you need to love off-road vehicles and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not mass transportation. But the mass transportation companies are saying, gee, we can use your platform to actually engage our customers and our uh, ecosystem with it. So all kinds of interesting things happening. So an engagement platform, real quickly, has four things. It's got people, like in this room. 
It's got artifacts, interfaces, and processes. But here's the key. We have to design it purposefully. If the experience of submitting a design, if the experience of uh, creating an accessory is not very good, people will stop participating. As simple as that. So what makes an engagement platform engaging? <laughs> Four things. The more inclusive you can make it, more creativity you can tap into. You need to understand what people want to do on the platform. What are the intentions? You've got to provide the tools like they provide to actually tap into people's ideas. And you have to understand how that value gets transformed. Who gets what? And, and how can you keep com them, you know, make them come back to it? Because a platform is only as good as participation. Otherwise, you know, having an empty platform is not very good, right? So the message is, don't kind of build a platform and hope they will come. If you've seen the Field of Dreams movie, it's an old movie, tells you how old I am. But uh, for those of you that have seen it, it's, it's not about that. It's actually building it with them. And they're already there. They're not going to come. They're already there because you're building it with them. So that's kind of one example. Hopefully, it uh, motivates engagement platform. I have basically three examples for those three layers. So this is kind of the central layer of a platform. The next example is Nike, which I find to be a very good example to motivate. What do you mean by value is a function of the experiences and not just the product or service? So if you think of Nike, what do you think? Shoes, sneakers, right? Sports and so on. But Nike has always made shoes. So you think of a company that makes shoes. Don't normally think of a company that's trying to create a better running experience for you. Because in the, in the old blue Nike, so to speak, most of the work was done once they launched the shoe out. Yeah, they did the surveys and market research and customer satisfaction. But really, they're in the business of making shoes. Now let's see what their latest strategy is, because I'm going to share with you something called Nike Plus, one of many offerings. Uh, this one's about uh, six years old in the market, doing very well. We come back and ask, what is Nike Plus? all about. Run, huh? Fantastic. Well, if you like running, you get a lot of running with Nike Plus. Picture yourself out on your own. With Nike Plus, that run becomes an endless parade of information about you. How fast you're going, how far you've gone, how long you've been at it, how many calories you've burned, it's all there, which is awesome on its own. But when you download that run at Nike Plus, you get your doors blown off. You'll see every run you've ever done, all the details, the whole angel up. Pull up maps of your runs. You'll know exactly where you got lost. Got any friends? Awesome. Put them to work. They can cheer you out while you're running by posting comments to the Facebook page. Better yet, challenge them. If they're really your friends, they'll still talk to you while they're choking on your dust. Nike Plus recognizes and rewards you for your efforts. Hi, Austin Bill. Congratulations on your fastest 5K ever. And when you're ready for the next challenge, Nike Plus will take care of that too. It will create a training program for you and help you stay on the path to victory. See what I mean? Doors blown off. Now go grab your shoes, get yourself some Nike Plus, and let's get out there. So, going back to our metaphor of blue and yellow making green, what is interesting here is the value chain kind of stopped, like in fact there's a famous Nike quote from one of the managers uh, uh, saying that the, the consumer experience kind of was the end point, you know, we sold the shoe and then yeah, we did some consumer experience stuff, but now it's a starting point, right, there's this whole world we haven't tapped into, the blue is getting immersed in the world of yellow, runners always ran, but they never actually participated with you while running, it's actually Nike is actually virtually running with you, imagine that Nike is your buddy there, right, well, the blue is kind of going along with the yellow. So that's an, a space they never tapped into. It was just selling the product, and you were off on your own in your world of running. Whereas now Nike is saying, we are going to insert ourselves in your world of running. And of course, you're saying, well, if you're going to insert yourself with me, well, you better create some value for me my way. Otherwise, you know, I don't like that intuition, perhaps. Right? So the point is, the value comes from this platform they've created, Nike Plus. It's around information, helping you achieve your goals, and so on. And what's interesting is, once you start thinking this way, what Nike has actually found is, Gee, you know, people want to engage with the coaches, with their workout trainers. So this ecosystem is expanding. Coaches, trainers, they have now partnerships with fitness gyms. Uh, and this was originally a partnership with Apple. Now they have a partnership with Google in terms of creating those maps that you saw and so on and so forth. So all of a sudden, there's an entire ecosystem, but it's all connected around your running experience and trying to make it as personalized as possible. So that's kind of like the Nike story. But I want to just mention one more thing, 30 seconds, and then we'll go to the next example, and I want to get to the organization side, which I know is kind of most interesting to you folks here. Uh, this uh, is an, the Nike app. 
Now, what happened is in 2007, as you know, you know Nike, uh, Apple introduced the iPhone. And so now, uh, uh, if, if you look at the end of the Nike Plus thing that I saw you, that's only one year old, the announcer actually said, go grab your shoes, right, and get out there, right? Go grab your shoes, join Nike Plus, and get out there. The announcer didn't say, go grab your Nike shoes. Because here's the interesting thing. Can you use Nike Plus and run with Adidas shoes? It's agnostic to what shoe you use. In fact, there are some runners, uh, I've seen actually some videos in Africa, who run bare feet with Nike Plus. Well, because it's nothing to do with shoes. It's to do with running and your experience of running. All you need to do is to strap something which actually collects data about your running. So that's very fascinating for me. If you think about Facebook and all of that, uh, it's really uh, platforms for conversation. And they're actually tapping into the social value uh, in, in that context. So this actually ex blows open the doors for Nike in, in so many ways. But the key is you'll only be successful if you really connect to the runner's experiences. The runner's experiences, very briefly, it comes from um, the context in which they're running. If you're running in a very unsafe place, probably what has most meaning to you for using Nike Plus is, well, I don't just need to know kind of where I am, but yeah, I know I got lost, but now I'm scared. So actually one of the Nike users who happened to be a software engineer, very quick story, he actually wrote something for the Nike, which actually pulls data on crime rates. So actually today, if you, if you do your map, it actually tells you whether there was a mugging or you know, this is how safe it is, and people actually provide that information. So actually Nike is providing some information, but actually the users are actually contributing information too, making it more valuable for themselves, and thereby Nike in the process. So it's really about context and events and meaning and involvement. Uh, the runners who are very involved take running seriously, run marathons, or you know, they want to achieve certain goals. Uh, they are actually contributing to the value uh, of, of this platform. Last piece, which is the ecosystem. I've motivated in both these examples, but I want to kind of use a different kind of example to kind of show why uh, increasingly uh, this is uh, co-creation is almost necessary uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, so to speak. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with ITC here, the example. Anybody here? No? Okay. So. Uh, I have a video, just, just so that we can all kind of be on the same page here. So ITC is a company, um, which is, uh, so I'll talk about ITC agribusiness. So one of their businesses is commodities. So they actually, for example, buy and process soya beans uh, uh, from farmers in India, and they actually uh, use that internally in the company to make consumer products. Uh, so, so they went actually direct to farmers rather than buy it from the marketplace so that they could uh, control the quality of the crop they get. So, so they have internal customers, sorry, and then they also have, uh, the, uh, they sell a lot of the grain in the commodities market as well. And they're trying to compete against, for example, the cargoes of the world by saying, you know, it's not just about pricing, but you can also adjust quality. And you can specify quality and we can get you the kind of quality you want. So it's got a dual motive. So in the front end, they actually engage with individual farmers and they build a platform where they actually tell the farmer what price they would get for the crop. So all you have to do is to bring your sample of the crop uh, they will test for moisture content, the whole uh, battery of stuff. And then they'll tell you what your price is. And they'll also tell you what's the price if you were to just go to like an ordinary marketplace run by the government mainly. Uh, that's what's called Monday over there. And uh, you'll get a better price, but then you need to have better quality in your crops. And so that kind of goes in. And here's a farmer I actually met uh, uh, recently uh, over the summer. Uh, and uh, you can notice, you know, he's sitting next to a PC. And so that PC is part of the platform. But he is a very important part. The human being is a very important part. Because this is a very carefully chosen farmer from the village who is very well respected and elder in this particular case. Uh, and he actually manages this platform locally in the village. He gets support from ITC, but ITC can't be there every day. So the customer, so to speak, is actually running the platform in this case. Let me show you the short uh, video which actually came out of a Ross School map project. So. It kind of shows the you first how level of solution is the e-job a well-connected PC run by a local farmer called the Sanchal. Here farmers can access the IBD rate along with the growing rates at several nearby markets, thus eliminating the information asymmetry and allowing the farmer to have power choice. The second level solution is the IBD processing center, where the farmer delivers his products. It's the most successful at all sorts of how they have people look at purchasing. Sample like it's done in India, it has a purchasing low in the test factory.
He's, he's another farmer, like the one I showed you. So the, the basic point here is that some of these farmers, not all of them, less than 5% of them, but the fact is those people have become very sophisticated. They actually track spot markets and they actually even know what the price is going to be uh, you know, next week. And so they hedge against that. Uh, so, yes, it's a story of access to information and all of that stuff, but really if you actually go and observe why it's so successful, because other people have tried this and failed, is as they say in IDC, they say the number one thing for us is the experience of the farmer. The dignity of the farmer, ensuring he gets respect when he actually goes to sell his crop, he gets paid in full, and the, that human experience as the kind of embodiment of the value is very important. It's supported by the platform, and then they've built this whole uh, ecosystem of capabilities. What do I mean? Well, they said, gee, the farmer says, a lot of the farmers didn't have quality. So they said, okay, I don't have, and they were getting actually very really disappointed. So IDC realized that maybe it's in their interest to actually not just educate the farmer, actually make his crops better. It's not just giving education, which means, gee, maybe we need to go and test the soil and give him the specific fertilizer that he needs, given his crop rotation cycle. Maybe he doesn't get enough rain. Well, we can create rain, but maybe we can harvest rainwater, and so on and so forth. So... They've created a whole ecosystem of organizations, all the way from farm input companies, microfinancing, and healthcare and education, seeing the farmer as an integral part of the community in which they operate. So if you think about what IDC has done, essentially, it, it realizes it has to embed itself more and more in the social community in which it operates, the natural communities. It actually has now a bunch of people looking at water tables, working with individual farmers, and seeing how to actually improve their access to water, and so on and so forth. Uh, and working civic community, communities, uh, working with NGOs who have access to these farmers and so on. So the capability ecosystem means that you've got to mesh together all these different capabilities. You can't do it yourself. So remember I said there are many kinds of blue. In the case of IDC, this boggles my mind. They have 460 blues, so to speak. They have 460 partners as of last month. I have never seen a company have that many partners and actually using it. And they say, gee, they say every farmer is different. You go to a farmer in southern India, his soil and the way he works and the way he wants to do farming is very different than somebody else in some other part. So they actually find that even in one given city or area or town, uh, there's so much, there's so much variation across farmers. So they really believe we have to tackle one farmer at a time. I said, are you kidding? I said, how many farmers are you tackling currently? Five million. So they treat every single farmer of the five million as a particular individual with whom they have to co-create his or her experience of value. That's their thinking, and that's what they're trying to do, and saying, we can do all of this, but it's not just about us, but together we can, with the farmers, making them part of this process of the ecosystem. So, this is kind of like the grand framework that's discussed in the book, but let's move on. <laughs> Pulling it all together. Three levels, real quickly. Top level is the experience. That's the outcome that is co-create TED, ED. The platform enables co-creating, and the ecosystem makes things co-creative. So when you think of co-creation, we need to sort these three things out. Creating the capacity for co-creation, making things co-creative, creating a platform for actually letting individuals participate, co-creating, and then if you do it right and pay attention to human experiences, you'll get very positive co-creative outcomes. So um, I would probably say I'm maybe one of the biggest students of uh, POS, because now I'm going to switch to that, because that's all I've been reading, because POS actually starts by saying, gee, we'll tell you a lot about positive outcomes, right? And so uh, I've tried to kind of understand that as much as I could, and with the guidance of a lot of the folks uh, in that center. And I'm now let me kind of connect to how this kind of co-creation-based view of enterprise and value creation, uh, I think, can create a, a whole new uh, kind of enterprise on the blue side, make it green, as I call it. 
But very quickly, so I told you it's joint creation, evolution, outcomes of value. Now let me add three more pieces to it. One is it's intensively enacted through platforms of engagements. It comes from these ecosystems of capabilities, and actually it's embodied in the human experience. Okay, I'm going to uh, kind of go through this very quickly. Uh, we've already talked, uh, let me just kind of point to a couple of things here. I'll focus on six and seven here. In order to get to co-creation, you know, ITC uh, started this in 2001. And the journey, they're saying, you know, it's a journey of a thousand miles is the quote from the CEO, and we have taken the first step. So, so it took 11 years to take the first step. So you have to get this. Now from here, there are all kinds of things we can do. So it's really uh, very uh, uh, inspiring to actually see people realize that uh, we can actually create a whole new generation of wealth, welfare, and well-being because the villages are enhanced, they're enhancing the education in the villages, the farmers are better off, and IDC makes money. And it gets better crops inside the company and the consumer package goods. Business has been able to differentiate its products with better quality inputs. So at the end of the day, uh, if you look at this point six here, we're really talking about democratizing value creation in the system and decentering it to the level of individuals. Now, uh, I'm now going to switch to uh, kind of inside the blue. <clears throat> Speaking of democratization of organizations, a lot has been written on how organizations uh, need to become more uh, democratized inside, and more and more uh, the uh, Gen Y employees, wherever I go, the CEOs tell me the number one issue is, how do we engage this younger generation uh, as much on their terms as ours? <laughs> so now, think of the yellow as the employee. Think of the blue as the organization that supports the employee engagement. Now, the question is, how do you build platforms to engage employees internally? So, uh, I wrote an article about two years ago on HBR uh, called Building the Co-Career Enterprise, and what I was trying to get at there was this the, the transformational change that's necessary on the, in the blue organization, which has been built for a blue world, to now build it for a green world. Now, the only way you're going to take the blue into green, like I said, is mixing with the yellow, which means that there's a huge process of transformation uh, that's required, and I've had lots of very interesting discussions with Bob, and I've learned a lot in terms of transformational change and deep change and so on. And a lot of those are very important because they actually can help people inside the blue start navigating this change to co-creation, which is what I've kind of spent a lot of time on. But as we'll see, it's through co-creation inside. So now I'm going to shift to kind of the process of transformation from inside the organization. And I'm going to share with you, I think, about three examples of uh, enterprises I found in my research that essentially seem to get it and help me understand what a future organization might look like. So the first one is Orange Telecom, which is actually has a public sector heritage. So I find it even more fascinating. It comes from France Telecom. If you uh, think of a bureaucratic organization, well, this would be one of them, right? And has 80,000 employees. I'm going to focus on Orange Telecom France. And I'm just simply going to show you a video of what they have done in the last uh, five years. The video is actually from 2008, if I recall, uh, when they had just started this initiative. It will talk about how they've engaged 16,000 of the 88,000 employees. Today, the number is 42,000. It will talk to you about the fact that they engage them, quote unquote, online, but you'll also see them being engaged offline. And what's the purpose of this? Uh, it's, called, it's a platform called ID Click, is to just harvest all the energy and ideas and creativity of their employees. Now, they had the good old suggestion box, which most companies have, but like one of the employees when I went to Orange Telecom and said, What's the big deal about this? Oh, the previous one was more like a, a black hole. Like you put stuff in it, you kept putting stuff in, hoping something would happen. It got sucked in, but no change happened. And then we stopped putting stuff in. So I think that story is kind of very familiar across a lot of organizations, or some things happen, but you're really not involved in what happens. So inputs are taken, but you're actually not participating in, for example, the decision-making process. This is a very interesting story uh, because they actually go deeper than that. The innovation of Orange's 16,000 employees represents a development of 50,000 ideas within only 18 months. The estimated worth? 700 million euros. It began on February 2nd, 2007, with determination to move forward, to earn responsibility, and to earn trust through messages, just like this one. I don't 
don't see why the person working somewhere gets an idea. Shouldn't it be allowed to act on it? If that's what's so. sweet. Push your limits with this simplicity challenge. A call for ideas that will simplify the daily lives of customers and employees alike. I do my part, and suddenly my life changes. Especially the desire to see one's ideas adopted into idea forums. I'm impressed by the innovators who innovate not only through their ideas, but also the way those ideas are deployed. This is what happens when 20% of employees speak out in a user-friendly medium. At the moment, we have more than one idea per minute on our site. It's called an ID clip. One posts their idea in a few lines, just like writing an email. Then they get the reactions of other employees on their blogs. Every idea is then directed toward one of 3,000 experts subscribed to ID Click. We now have a well-developed network of experts from all levels of our organization, from the various trades, from the local departments, and each operations unit. If an expert accepts an idea, he develops it in conjunction with other experts. Experts don't work by themselves, they work in a network. There's no trick to being an expert, all you need to do is your job. All we need to do now is convince people in the field to try it out. Of course, there's the weekly operations chart, which compares the performances of authors and experts by regions and divisions. We found something much better. The innovation mood. A seven-night car trip around France to tell everyone Congratulations, and keep up the good work. And the results? There are currently over 16,000 innovators, and that's pretty cool. But the main thing is that beyond the communication involved, we're currently seeing that ideas are being submitted naturally without any obstacles. It's great. You tell people, tell me what you want to do. Tell me how you want to simplify things. And they talk. I let them talk. I think it's just wonderful, and I hope it will go beyond talking as they'll actually be able to concretize their dreams. Dreams are coming true. 3,500 ideas are being experimented on or have already been enacted in the last 18 months. For example, posts that are planted the way nails are driven in, Prefab stands to distribute broadband. And especially thousands of employees that are moving forward, that are creating added value and inspiring others to follow suit. So, uh, what is a little quickly here, uh, I have two more examples to share. Um, what I find very fascinating here is uh, about 42,000 uh, employees are engaged, meaning they've submitted at least one idea. But I think what's important to see here is that they've actually evolved and they've actually built this platform together with the employees. I'll give you two quick examples. So, first it was like on your desktop. So, which means that to submit an idea, you have to come to the office and then log in and, and submit an idea, uh, the ID click. Now, of course, this is a telecom company. You'd wonder why they didn't do this sooner, but you know, it took them a year to develop an app. <laughs> okay? But once they had it on their phones, one of these employees actually saw that post being driven in. He actually was at a soccer game with his family, uh, watching uh, you know, the ball game. Um, and I just actually saw the uh, Lions game yesterday. Right? So it's one of those things, right? And then you're there watching the game. And I don't know how many times I'd take my kid to the bathroom and, you know, buy popcorn and buy those peanuts and so on, right? So you're enjoying the game. But here's what happened there. He's watching soccer, and he sees these, these lights, and he's an engineer. He gets an idea. He says, gee, maybe we should uh, deploy our broadband equipment in this kind of way, you know, by driving it into the ground. So somewhere his neuron fired in his brain. 
Why and how? We don't know. But that particular employee on that particular day had an idea, like we all do, right? But what happens is it dissipates. Why does it dissipate? Because we don't act on it. Now, all he had to do amidst all this, you know, the soccer experience there is go in, do the, you know, in a line, here's my idea, and I think, you know, this will create value for, it says, for whom you have to say, whom does it create value for, in what way? That's it. Hit send. <laughs> and presumably there was a goal, and he had to take his kid to the bathroom and all of that. And there's a true story. Monday morning, he actually forgotten about it, like most of us do, <clears throat> right? But morning, 10 o'clock, he gets an alert on his phone saying, hey, remember you submitted an idea? He said, like, I did? Really? What idea? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. Well, he gets a call from one of his experts. You want to talk about it? I want to understand what this is. And so, yada, yada, yada. And uh, next thing you know, you know, it's, it's been implemented. But it's more than that. He's actually engaged throughout this process. Uh, I don't know if I have, uh, uh, here, here's a slide. <laughs> Behind the scenes, there's a whole process of how these things are managed. The employee actually gets points for it. It's called talent points. People who respond to that idea on, on their blogs also get points for it. And what do you do with the points? You actually can use the points to get something for yourself. So they initially had an e-commerce site where you could go and get gifts, right? And people said, I already have a TV at home, which was the things on the site you could get, the points. I already have a Nintendo Wii, and some of the electronic stuff, it's not exciting. I come home, my kid would probably say, yeah, you bought it at the store, rather than I'm proud father who contributed to this company, right? <clears throat> or I can tell my fellow employees, gee, I'm an innovator. So they realized they had to, they had to co-create the platform itself with the employees. And in fact, some of the employees said, why don't you have a place where we can tell you how to make ID click better? Right? So that we have a better experience with it. So they created this forum, and the ideas came pouring in. And it turns out that the number one thing that everybody liked after they voted for different things, you are not going to believe this, was a mug. Maybe you believe it. You saw those t-shirts that also came out of that. A mug? Well, a mug says, I'm an innovator. It's very visible. You put it on your uh, 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 desk. These are open offices. Everybody can see that you submitted an idea. Much more visual, much more value for me. I can go home and say, you can't get this on Amazon or any other website. All right? It's unique. Only way you can get it is through ID Click. So the lesson here is that you know, co-creation doesn't stop. It's not enough you build a platform, okay, time to go home. No, of course, you, you continue the process. And what you actually find is, if, you don't have to sit there and do all the work, actually. Right? It's, but you have to involve people, and you, you have to kind of make sure that you know, things are transparent as they go along. You have this ongoing active dialogue with them, and uh, so on and so forth. There are a whole, whole bunch of principles there. Uh, in the case of our, uh, ID Click, it turns out that, that participation and contribution is important. But every employee has a dashboard. They actually have like a FedEx tracker. You can type your, your idea number, actually, like your tracking package. And it will actually tell you where your idea is. It will tell you in the system where it is. Is it sitting in some local department with your manager? What's going on with that idea? And you can actually track it. And then if that idea actually ends up getting deployed, you get a bonus. Not in money, but in these points. Then some of these employees came and said, gee, well, mug is good. I've submitted. I don't want like 50 mugs. But, well, most of them like three, four ideas, right? Four mugs, OK. I got one mug. That's good enough. Maybe two, OK? How about uh, charities? People said, we want to contribute. Can we use this money to contribute to charities? So now they actually have charities. Now they actually involve a charity organization, right? So this whole thing is kind of growing with various kinds of things connecting, if you will, with this kind of uh, ID Click platform, a simple example. Now this is uh, internal co-creation. Um, Starbucks actually has a similar platform, but uh, with customers. It's called My Starbucks Idea. Just to, if you go to mystarbucksidea.com, you'll see this. Uh, and okay, you, you go to Starbucks right here. Uh, on South U, well, they've remodeled a store, by the way, right? Uh, and inside stories, they remodeled with people from Ann Arbor and the surrounding community. Uh, a lot of the lo wood is actually from local, uh, source, uh, local sourcing, so to speak. Things on the wall, certain things are corporate stuff to maintain a consistent look, but they try to involve people in the design of the store. They also involve the baristas in creating a store. I actually check with them, okay? So the basic uh, point here is that in Starbucks, anybody can go and submit ideas. It's meant for customers. So you talk about your experience. Uh, it could be about building community and social responsibility. That's part of the Starbucks charter as well. So this, how can we help you? In fact, they have uh, Jobs for America program, uh, and you can actually go and get a wristband and so on. A lot of that has come actually through here. So they've actually implemented over 100 ideas last year through the site. The way it works, similar to Orange, is behind the scenes, there are specific Starbucks employees, 
and uh, depending on what they're working on, and they're fully transparent, they tell you what's in the works and what's been launched. Uh, they're working on some new mobile app, clearly, because Cindy works with mobile and emerging platforms. And Cindy is now kind of the manager of the moment of the platform. Out there in front of customers saying, okay, we've developed this app. Is it any good? Okay, maybe it works well on Android. doesn't work well on uh, Apple. Whatever it is, you tell us. So constantly having this ongoing conversation takes place over 90 days. Case closed. Cindy goes back to what she was doing. Sarah comes in. Or Katie comes in. Katie managed this. And if you talk to Katie... She's a nutritional scientist. She goes, you know, I got an office way back there. I've been trying to get this company focused on nutrition, but now I'm at the strategy table. Why? Because I have this platform. Uh, we're now focused on healthy food. We've taken out all the artificial stuff like um, artificial dyes, no high fructose corn syrup, no artificial trans fats. Uh, by the way, everything at, at uh, Starbucks as of last year uh, is essentially uh, healthy in that sense. They've actually worked with the suppliers uh, to, to re-engineer all the ingredients. In the process, they finally have an oven at the back so you can get actually hot sandwiches, which you couldn't. Another thing the customers wanted. But then they said, gee, if we had that, uh, there's still an issue because it, the sandwiches emit aroma. It interferes with the smell of coffee. When I walk into Starbucks, I want to smell coffee, not some sandwich. That's not our strategic positioning. Well, it turns out suppliers uh, came in. They also participated. And they've re-engineered the ingredients. They've done taste tests. There are lots of stuff uh, which are connected with this platform. But an end result is successful product launch, hugely successful increase in revenues, earnings, profits. One of their four pillars of their transformation process, if you read Howard Schultz's book, he talks about this as one of the four pillars. And essentially, uh, if you saw his quote in the beginning, it's co-creating the Starbucks experience together with the customers and baristas and the suppliers. That's their basic strategy. Next quick example, uh, since we are hitting kind of uh, the, the one o'clock mark here, uh, this comes from the French post office. Um, one of my colleagues is French. Um, and uh, I, I use this example because, okay, Starbucks, you know, maybe baristas would be engaged. But the French post office, try engaging teller employees. I mean, if you put a platform out there, I can tell you, you'll get probably zero ideas. <clears throat> Nobody is interested. In fact, they tell me the French post office, people come through the back door and leave by the back door. They don't even cross what's called the yellow line to engage with customers, right? So they don't even know what it looks like from the other side. I'm not kidding you. So imagine if you walk to the post office, right, from the back door, and then you walk out from the back door. You don't know what it's like for a customer who's coming in from the other side as a customer, comes in, and probably doesn't, you know, can't see the board, you know, it's way back there. You just can't connect with the customer experience. Just cannot. Who cares, though, right? So what they realized is, if you're going to do customer co-creation, we better do employee co-creation first. So they started actually by asking employees, how can we transform your life, just like uh, ID Click? And I'm going to share a short video clip. It's a fascinating story because they've transformed 11,000 of the 70,000 post offices in France. It's a true story uh, over a period of two and a half years. And as of today, you'll be surprised. They have a website. Teller employees are giving ideas. They wouldn't have imagined it uh, in the history of the post office. Thank you. 
engagé, c'est faire participer et donner la main. Et on s'est rendu compte réellement que qu'on euh, avait d'abord un élan potentiel de, de changement au sein de nos établissements et qu'on euh, obtenait un changement beaucoup plus en faisant participer les gens au changement qu'en leur demandant de changer, euh, comme ça avait été le cas jusqu'à là. So, a couple of interesting things there. What has happened is that it's open now from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., never in French history. And remember, they're unionized. And what is very interesting is that the employees have driven this transformation, working with the unions, making sure they still have the, their work week hours. It's open now on Saturdays, never in French history. And not only have a subset of them cross the yellow line, in fact, those consultants that you saw there, they're actually teller employees. They are the teller employees, a small percentage of them that actually get this. And they actually are part and parcel of the transformation process. So they actually have a croissant breakfast session with customers now, believe it or not, suggested by them. They do it themselves. Nobody told them to. Um, and they schedule their own work weeks. Uh, they make sure things, that these changes fit in with the local environments, as you saw. And in fact, it turned out that they changed the opening hours on Saturday to 7 a.m. Uh, last year because they believed it would coincide with the French open market where people come to do their uh, shopping and you know, they can also do the post office services. All with their approval uh, and uh, in, a, in a quite a highly unionized bureaucratic environment. So the point here is that co-creation can actually help facilitate this huge amount of change and unleash all this uh, kind of uh, positive energy that is just kind of bottled up there, actually. Uh, but it requires this kind of platform through which uh, these things can, can uh, flower. I'm going to con conclude with uh, this example of Mahindra, uh, which actually came out of an executive program that we do with Mahindra. Ross has a program we do in terms of management development. Uh, so as uh, Chris mentioned, I teach a course on co-creation, uh, MBA class, but I also teach co-creation the executive program. And one of the managers uh, in August 2010, his name is Naveen Chopra. He's part of the automotive group, he's head of quality. Uh, so he was really taken in. It's actually his birthday today. I just sent him his uh, birthday wish. And uh, as uh, Bob knows, there's always you know, these leaders who uh, take the chart, who see it, and they, go, and they actually have the ability to actually transform the culture of the organization. It's, it's amazing to watch. So I've been working with them very closely for the last two years, learning a lot, of course, kind of riding on his shoulder, so to speak. And uh, what is interesting is he has essentially started transformation in the areas in which kind of he, of course, controls, which is in manufacturing, uh, in the, the manufacturing plants in Nasik City, where they actually make cars. So I'm going to roll a short video, uh, which actually will feature his boss, who is the vice president of operations. And it actually started with that. He went back. He put together a presentation for his team based on this. I had some Skype sessions with them. And then it expanded beyond his core team, went to 50 people, 100 people. Then uh, in 2011, I, I did a session for 5,000 people. Uh, and you'll see them uh, in here, which is a, a huge... Uh, he said, I need to broadcast this. I said, I have a webinar. He said, yeah, but I want, it's a live session online. So, sorry, it's an online session. And then in, uh, uh, last year, he said, I want them all in a physical room like this, in a place. I said, what are you going to do? Hire a st uh, rent a stadium? He said, yeah. <laughs> so we actually took this huge place, and you'll see that in the video. Uh, there were about 1,000 people there. Uh, to really say that in every single employee, in his view, uh, needs to, like he says, breathe co-creation. It should be a way of life. And no matter what you do, there is always some interaction you're having with somebody that you're working with, whether in your team or somebody you're serving, you know, uh, as an internal customer and so on. So if people get this mindset of co-creation, according to Naveen, he says, we'll just totally transform this organization. And he's got a lot of success and results and in the process of writing this up. Um, but I just want to share that short video with you because I think it kind of shows the power of co-creation. And you'll see the VP of operations talking about how they've actually engaged the government in the local areas. Uh, they've actually enga engaged banks in there in terms of financing of vehicles. Uh, they've worked with the schools in the area. So it's kind of one of those things which is rapidly expanding. And then I'll kind of conclude with some remarks on how co-creation can create a better society for, for all of us uh, if we have the power to actually participate and uh, create uh, a better world for all of us. So that's kind of... Uh, 
where we will end. So just the video and a couple of uh, concluding remarks, and then I know you folks have other more interesting, valuable things to do. Okay. Professor Vikar Ramaswamy, senior government officials from Nasik, dignitaries from Nasik City, seniors from AFS, our value partners and business associates, and ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to this unique event in the history of Mahindra and particularly in the history of Nasik City. I will just take you back journey of rice to co-creation. In August 2010, there was a leadership program arranged in Mahindra and Professor Venkat Ramaswamy was sharing about the co-creation. And Mr. Navin Chopra really got excited with this idea of co-creation and he thought why not to really leverage this for implementation of Mahindra Rice to co-creation and journey really started from August 2010. And this, is, this has become a unique practice in Mahindra and we are trying to really leverage or brand this practice as new initiative or new practice for years to come. Initially, this particular co-creation concept was started, we were not knowing, it was new to us. In a quality department of NASA, after its stupendous success, we are really employed this particular concept in, across the NASA plant. Not forgetting the great momentum, this was shared with our top management in various forums and they also really appreciated this initiative. And we are seeing the results of that. And let me share with you, in a senior management team communication, two and a half hours were spent on this initiative to understand and really assimilate this initiative at senior levels. And today, it is well understood and deployed by all the seniors in a manner. Now we are making efforts to really take it to all the sectors of a And when we were doing that, we were getting the success in every, every area. Now we at the plan feel that we are cohesive team and any issue we are able to solve with the great speed. Now we are taking this initiative to all our stakeholders, to our value suppliers, where actually we can really co-create not only our organization, but their organization. Actually, this is a great concept where actually we work together and really create something new where actually both the parties are immensely benefited. I urge all the dignitaries and all the government officials from NASIC, let us partner today and to really understand co-creation and co-create the NASIC city as the best industrial city in India. And this is the opportunity available for all of us. We as Mahindra. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, I actually see this huge, as you, as you can see, it's talking about co-creating in Nasik City. Uh, I've been the two mayors who want to co-create the city. If you go to the web, you'll see co-create London.com, co-create Toronto.com, and so on, and co-create Chicago also. So what is happening is people are starting to see this as kind of a way in which people can actually engage together. Of course, the question is how do you actually focus on human experience? And what I try to do is to kind of figure out a way in which we can do that very systematically in a very structured way uh, rather than ad hoc way. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Amartya Sen is, human beings are not merely means of production, but also the end of the exercise. <laughs> so I think what is interesting for me is that, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, already uh, in my mind what I'll probably tackle next in my next book, which is how do you think of economies and societies as a nexus of private, public, and social enterprises? That's the, the key idea. Talk to me about six years from now and see if uh, something's happened here. But it's a big idea. I just uh, find it very fascinating uh, that uh, there's something here uh, that can actually be uh, a better way of creating, an, uh, you know, a better world order, shall we say. 
I take inspiration from the fact that uh, there are people recognizing this. So this is the famous uh, Ron Course, uh, amazing, as you know, over 100 years old, and he's writing a column for HBR, and he's starting a new journal at 102, I think he's 102 now. Uh, I said, whoa, <laughs> okay, what is the journal called? Man and Economy. And if you haven't seen this article, I highly encourage you, it's just one page, uh, I can share it with you. It, it says, the degree to which economics is isolated from the ordinary business of life is extraordinarily unfortunate. Coming from wrong course, we better take it seriously. He's seen more economy than any of us combined. Okay? And it's very interesting for me. Uh, he says, this was not the case in the past. When modern economics was born, Adam Smith envisioned it as a study of the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. It's a minor work. The wealth of nations is widely read by business people, businessmen, even though Smith disparaged them quite bluntly for the greed, short-sightedness, and other defects. This book also stirred up and guided debates among politicians to trade and other economic policies. The academic community in those days was small. Economists had to appeal to a broad audience. Even at the turn of the 20th century, Alfred Marshall managed to keep economics as both a study of wealth and a branch of the study of man. And he actually basically says that we need to connect economy and man, to put it very succinctly, which is the title of his journal. <clears throat> now, to me, that's kind of interesting because what he's actually saying is economy, remember, blue, man, yellow. And I, I'm saying the way to connect the economy and man is through co-creation. So that's my humble uh, way in which I kind of relate to this article because I think the answer lies in co-creation. This is, I think, uh, the problem that's very well stated that there's, there's an issue here uh, in terms of how we move forward. One of Bob's favorite quotes I know is uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. I actually believe perhaps we can create change in economy and society through co-creation, leave alone just in enterprises. Uh, they're obviously the means to doing that. So the question really is, can we co-create change uh, in terms of the world we want to experience both personally and also collectively? So that's kind of uh, where I'm at in my ongoing journey in whatever years I have left. And uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, C.K. Pralat, who was uh, an inspiration, still lives in my heart, uh, and uh, the people that have encouraged me uh, who are out sitting in this room, then you know who you are. So thank you very much, but I want to wish each one of you all the best because I believe that each one of you can co-create the future because ultimately it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, even the concept itself is undergoing co-creation uh, as we speak. Hence, I'm going to have a wiki and, you know, people can help all of us learn more about what it ought to be. Thank you very much.